Raymond Nickerson is a he, was a, um, he has a PhD from Tufts, he was a psychologist, and he, he, in 1969 he said this, which just blows my mind, because in 1969 the most advanced computer was this thing. But it says, sorry for the overlay, the need for the future is not so much computer-oriented people as for people-oriented computers. And he, it was a great idea. We can see in 1969 that's the, the most advanced computer we had. Um, at our disposal. This brought us to the moon somehow. I love this because it has these buttons. I, I love this thing. It has these buttons, verb and noun, which <laughs> I don't know how someone uses this. But our verb and noun in you know, 20 years, less than 20 years, we get the Apple Lisa, which is Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak's kind of answer to more human-friendly interfacing. We see, obviously, in 2007, with the, in the invention of the iPhone, we have touch bases. So we no longer we have to type in computer language to talk to a computer. A computer is now speaking our language. We're dragging files into folders. We're dragging them into trash cans. We're no longer typing lines of code. We're doing very human things. And this is the progression we're going towards. More human, more user-based design solutions for our technology. So in a nutshell, I don't know how much time I have. Seven minutes. Seven minutes? It's a new record. But that's I've been doing including Q&A. Including Q&A? I'll just do some Q&A then. But that's basically the nutshell is designing for universal users. It's not only the trend, it's the right thing to do. It's the idea that if you design for everybody, you're going to get better <coughs> products that are better used. You're not going to marginalize any people that shouldn't be marginalized. You should embrace their differences because if it works for everyone, it's going to work for your average person. So that's what I have to say, at least so far. So if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them. I just bombarded you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So back to your museum picture. What's sure. Different, uh... I can go over those as well. I'm pretty familiar with all of those projects. So is the, the implications of this that you have to have multiple stations, or are the stations themselves designed for multiple users? It completely depends. Uh, right now, a lot of the trends, museums love the idea of multi-touch, multi-user things. Whether that's the right solution, another question. But you know, the museum higher up, they see these bigger screens, these more resolute screens. So like, we want this, we want 50 kids on this at the same time. I mean multiple styles, multiple approaches. So oh, yeah. The, but these are very, what's interesting is these are very four different modalities. Sure. And so it, it is you, are you striving to push the museum to have four modalities, or is each one of those modalities able to be used in a significantly different way? It's very, it's very specific to a specific learning goal. So okay. when we design something, it's, it's the museum saying, we want this idea, this idea, and this idea to get across. Uh, but make it fun, make it engaging, uh, make it productive and exciting. Get people, because basically museums are dying. They know this, they know they need to adapt technology. People aren't going to museums, they're Googling in front of screens. So how can we get children to get to museums? And so we are given a learning goal where we kind of synthesize what's important and given our technology, our budget limitations, our time limitations, we create a solution that fulfills that learning goal but at the same time is accessible to all. What's been your most challenging, uh, what, what's been the, the most difficult challenge you've had in designing for a museum for children? For children? <laughs> so, actually, I'll, I'll bring it up right now. This will be great, actually. This is actually perfect timing. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, this is great because I'm not. So this is a project I actually worked on. This is one of the hooks I brought. This is how I brought people in here. This is Hoha Museum in Inner Mongolia, which is part of China, as I realized. And it's entirely in Mandarin, which meant that I had to design entirely in Mandarin. And we had to struggle with translators and everything. And the learning goal for this was basically um, so it was emotional literacy for children three to seven. These children may may or may not be able to read, but they can they have a working understanding of Mandarin. And the idea is that we're creating these collages, these visual sentences, um, to show that you can be sad, 
and then you can do things to change your mood to be happy and it's okay to go back and forth it's like emotional literacy is very important at that age um, so this this would be in a museum a 27 inch touch screen and it says touch begin this is probably the biggest barrier for us english speakers is what in what am i actually being asked here but it says touch to begin so as soon as you touch it you understand that's your input uh, and it says some things i'll turn the volume up this is all spoken actually in Mandarin as well. And just so student kids can understand it, the idea, is, and I'm paraphrasing because I really don't know what it says, it says, you can change your mood from sad to happy. Let's learn how. So you click go. And what it's doing is it's telling you to take a picture. So you say you want to take a picture of you being sad. Uh, so you take a picture of you being sad. I don't know if I can do that at the moment. <laughs> You take four pictures. That's a good one. And then you pick which one you like the best. And it gets added to your collage. You continue. And you get to choose two things that make you happy. That's what it says here. So you say, I like to... Uh, I like to draw. Oh, I love the words. They're fantastic. And these are all illustrations that I did based on what I believe a child that three to six years old in Mongolia would really appreciate. I mean, this took, this, these little guys took probably more work than anything else on the screen just to get them right. You know, they had to, to feel kind of tactile and cute. You feel like you can squeeze them if you're a little happy about it. How do you know when they were right? <sighs> you, you just, boom, testing, testing. We had to get a test, uh, we couldn't really find Mandarin children ar around, so we, just, we had to just find children in general, but like, we asked them, what do you think about these guys? Like, we like them. So, but they, they start out as kind of stick figure or lanky people and just didn't really show the cuteness that I was going for. So you click these two things and it shows you what can you do to make others happy. And using color to say this is an us to us, this is someone else who may be sad, blue, even in China is a signifier for sadness. So we use this, we use kind of color to show these things and I say I like to um, play sports with people and I, Give people flowers. Yeah, well, I know what it says. But we go much more. And now you take another picture to finish it off of you being happy. This is a good one too. So go is your visual sentence. This is what makes me this is sad, this is what makes me happy, and this is me happy at the end. And it's a quick no more than two minutes. Uh, a child can walk themselves through this. Click go. Their sentence gets added to the rest of the people. And this gets populated over time throughout the day. These are my coworkers. That's, uh, I don't know what that is, but um, this is great too. But yeah, this is, this is something that's meant to be uh, put in a museum where you're just populating it and you start to see your happiness and sadness in context with other people. So if that didn't interest your question, this was incredibly challenging. <laughs> How long did it take you to do that? Thank you. Uh, about, this is from beginning to end, when I first got the, uh, the learning goals and everything, um, the uh, design standards, about six months turnaround time, which is fairly luxurious in our field. So, one more question. I can probably get one more question in here, right? Did I answer it quick enough? Well, thank you. Oh, I, have, I have a question. One more. Okay, so looking back, so you had a, B, a few of BFA in design yes. from us, and then you've now done all these other things. Like mm -hmm. you've had a lot of other, other, other coursework. What do you think was the most significant thing beyond your design? I took a psychology class. I've been telling everybody this. I took a de 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 developmental psychology class um, with people who were in the field, and it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I learned so much. What class was that? Was that GSAS? That was Jesus. Fascinating. Way over my head, but I loved it. With counselors? Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> not, I, didn't, I, I never took a psychology class. Right, and you were kind of a fish out of water. Uh, yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> I learned a lot, though. It was really great. They took me in. But, yes, thank you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.